couple places, but primarily we're going to stay in Philippians 2. We're going to finish out this month of thankfulness and thanks living by focusing on this passage in Philippians 2, thanks living by service and serving. I did fail to mention this Saturday is our last Blitz Saturday of 2023. If you haven't known what a Blitz Saturday is, we've been planning once a month, the first Saturday of every month, we go out, we team up as, as partners, and we go out and just give out gospel tracts to folks in Lake Station. I was looking at some of our streets, and we've, we've gotten about 75% of, that's, that's a rough estimate, of, of the houses in Lake Station we've stopped by this year. Can you believe that? We've about, about, about three-fourths of all the homes in Lake Station we've stopped by and knocked on their door at some point this year. And uh, we want to close that out this December, this Saturday. So be here, usually meet at 9.30 and get some coffee and some donuts. And we usually head out by about 10 and head back here. We're here by 11.00. And we're, we're all done and wrapped up by then. So if you would like to be here for our final Blitz Saturday, we're just going to team up. Teenagers, you're welcome. We've seen a few of those in the last few weeks. Our teenagers, our young adults, our adults, we're going to go give the gospel to every creature. And you don't have to be a talker. You say, I'm nervous. We'll put you with somebody who's going to go out and talk for you. But that'll be this Saturday. This morning, we're going to study the mind of Christ. And I'm really going to preach this morning. It's really not a message that's life-altering or life-changing. It's a very simple message, but I want you to, I want to really get to your minds today. I want to speak to your thought process, and I think the Bible is going to be clear on, on um, what, what the Lord has for us today. Let's all stand, and as we, as we turn to Philippians 2, we're going to honor God's word as we read verses 3 through 11. Verses 3 through 11. Just follow along in your scriptures. Starting in verse 3 of Philippians 2, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and of things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is just so powerful. So it's so necessary and needful for me today and for us here today. And I ask, Lord, that I simply am not a hindrance, that I don't stop, that I don't alter that I don't misrepresent the power of your words. And we ask that, Lord, the preaching today of the word of God would do wonders for each and every heart that is gathered here today. Lord, may you do a work. I do not want to meet here today and just go through and play church and stamp and check off a list. We ask, Lord, that you would meet with us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Go and be seated. Thanks living demands serving. This passage has always captured my thoughts and my mind, especially those words in verse 5 when it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, friends, I will just tell you honestly, frankly, I do not think like my Heavenly Father. It's not a natural thing for me to think like Jesus Christ. But we are called and we are petitioned, we are asked in this passage to think like Christ thinks. I, I preached a message almost about a year ago on something similar to this, and I, uh, one of our church members made me a T-shirt. It says, T-L-C, think like Christ. And I really enjoy that because that's really what I'm going to speak on this morning is making a, a difference in our thought process, and our thought process is going to go to this place of service. This morning, I want to remind you of the importance of being a servant, 
a servant is not something we naturally want to do. I mean, who naturally wants to be placed to the lowest degree of a servant? In fact, this Bible term, if we could call it this, it would be slavery. Now, that, that is not a positive term in our world today. Who would volunteer to be a slave? But this is the mind of Christ today. See, Pastor, I, that doesn't sound like a great commercial for your sermon yet. It doesn't. But I'm going to tell you today that having this mindset is the greatest mindset you can possibly have. I'm going to show you in a couple passages how important it is for God's children, for Christians, for us to think like a servant. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter number 9. We're going to go to Mark 9 and Mark 10. So this is the second book of the New Testament. We're going to read a couple thoughts from our Savior as he gives to us today on the importance of service, the importance of serving, the importance of placing oneself into the role of servitude. Mark chapter number 9, if you will. And we're going to look at just a few verses starting in verse 33. See, the disciples were convinced that the kingdom of heaven was near. Now, I'm convinced that the kingdom of heaven is drawing near. I mean, anybody with me on that? I'm convinced that we're really close to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I, I'm already getting started on a new series that we're going to be doing as we kick off the new year and as we enter into the new year on prophecy and things we see in the coming kingdom. I'm excited for that. How many of you are excited for the coming kingdom? I'm looking forward to it. And by the way, the Lord could come back before I do those messages, so then we'll all be throw those out the window. But I believe the Lord's coming soon. The disciples were waiting for his kingdom. Now, they didn't know he was going to ascend and leave them and give them the commission to start the church and to give the gospel. The Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah would set up a kingdom that would be an eternal kingdom. A kingdom that would, uh, the Messiah would rule and reign on the throne of his father David. And he would have not only control of Israel, but of the whole world. By the way, that's Jesus Christ. And he's going to come again to a neighborhood near you. And he's going to set up his kingdom. And he's going to rule and reign over this whole earth. And the Bible says there will be peace unlike we have not seen since before the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. That's coming. The disciples were having arguments as they noticed that the time was coming to a close. The Savior began to speak to them about the ending of his ministry. And they started sensing it and they started arguing among themselves over who should be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, I'm going to show you in Mark 9, they had this argument. I'm going to show you in Mark 10, they had this argument. They had it a few other times in the Gospels. Even up until that Last Supper, they were still arguing about this. Look at Mark 9, verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them. Jesus asked his disciples. Are you with me? What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace. For by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Do you see it in the passages? And when he sat down, he called the twelve, and he saith, unto, he saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and, together with me if you have the passage, servant of all. Now this argument continued. If you go to Mark chapter number 10, go to verse 35 of Mark 10. This is the next chapter in your Bibles. There were two, two disciples that were in the inner three circle, James and John. They were called the sons of Zebedee or the sons of thunder. Look at verse 35 of Mark 10. It says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatever we desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of 
and with the baptism that I am baptized, with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard of it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Now pause for a moment. Did they just have a fight the chapter before? In fact, the Bible uses the word disputed and disputing many times. And here, now the other ten disciples are, are upset that James and John, because they asked Jesus, Jesus, can you give us one request in your kingdom? He said, well, tell me what your request is, which I think he already knew what they were going to ask, but he said, all right, go ahead. And they said, we want to be on your right hand and left hand. We want to be next in charge in your kingdom. We want to be the greatest in your kingdom. Notice what he says in verse number 41. I'm sorry, verse number 42. Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. Levels of authority. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. There's that phrase, servant of all again. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Now, if you could go back to our passage in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to stay right there. Go back to Philippians chapter number 2. I never thought I'd see the day where a deacon would walk the aisle. Isn't that amazing? Praise the Lord, Brother John. The Holy Spirit's working already. Thank you, John. By the way, that was a great servant's heart. We're going to talk about that today. But the disciples were not thinking like Christ in regards to service, were they? They were not thinking like Christ was. And they were more interested in having authority than being in to told what to do. Do you naturally like being told what to do? I mean, did you come out of your mother's womb and being a child, did you like being told what to do? Uh, that is something, folks, that in the kingdom of God, we've got to learn that one. If you read the book of Psalms, David was a man after God's own heart. I'm convinced in this regard, he loved being told what to do. He had a servant's heart. That's why God put him in charge. And today I want to remind us the importance, if we're going to be thankful in our living, we must recognize the mind of Christ in servitude. Let's look at a couple things here today. This is the Christian's path in life. We're to become servants. You have Philippians chapter 2 there? Who has Philippians 2? Say amen. amen. Okay, make sure you have it there, all right? Because we're going to go through this verse by verse as we look at verse number 3. This servant's heart and this mind that Christ wants us to have, first of all, is a servant in heart first. We're to serve in heart first. That's our first point on the screen. That's found in verse number three. The Bible says this, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Now pause. Were the disciples having an argument over who would be greatest? Yes? I think they were having strife and vainglory. And as I read this passage in Mark this week, I thought, man, this is the perfect illustration in Philippians chapter 2. Because these disciples, they were not getting along. And as they were not getting along, it was because they were not thinking like Christ. They were not thinking like a servant. I want you to write something down if you have notes today. I want you to think like Christ. Thinking like Christ is thinking like a servant. Catch me on this one? Thinking like Christ is thinking like a servant. A servant is not going to get into a lot of fights with his master if he's thinking like a servant. And I'm going to give you this first point. It says there in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Nothing. So we have to first, letter A, refuse strife and vainglory. Nothing. That means there should be no fighting in our lives, in our relationships, especially with our authorities. Allow others to have their way. This is the mind of Christ. Because, you say, Pastor, why should we allow other people to have their way? Because you are called to serve them. Your primary objective this week, as ordained by our Heavenly Father on this earth, is to serve one another. That's your primary objective. 
This is the mind of Christ as we become to think like him. Proverbs 13, verse 10 says this, Only by pride cometh contention. Only by pride cometh contention. You say, why do we have contention? Why did those disciples have fighting? Why were they disputing one with another? Why were they getting mad that John, I'm sorry, that Peter and, no, James and John asked that question? It was because they had pride. And pride is not fitting of a servant. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3 is on your screen. For ye are yet carnal. That word carnal means fleshly, following the flesh. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? So to be a servant in heart, you have to refuse strife. That urge that you have to say something because you've been offended, because you have been overlooked, because you have been mistreated, realize that you are called to do nothing through strife or vainglory. Look at the rest of that verse, verse number three. You ready? It says, but in lowliness of mind. Do you see that phrase? Do you guys see that phrase? Lowliness of mind. In lowliness of mind. What do you think that lowliness of mind means? Well, it means to think of yourself as undeserving. To think of yourself as undeserving. Let the next point up here. Look at that next screen. Think lowly. Think of yourself as undeserving. Now, I'll be honest with you. There are many times that I think quite the opposite in this regard. I think that I am quite deserving. Do we have any married couples in here? Any married couples in here? All right, we got a few. All right. Every once in a while, you somehow think in marriage that you are deserving of better treatment. Have you ever thought that before? That is what's called fleshly thinking. The Bible says, are you not carnal? You think in the flesh. That's why there's strife and envying, and that's why there's arguments, because somehow along the way, you have thought that you are deserving. This is the problem with Thanksgiving today. Are you ready? You know why some people did not give thanks this last week? They thought they were deserving of something better. When in reality, we have to, let's be honest, we're not deserving of anything good. The Bible says that we have no goodness of ourselves. There is none good, no, not one. I am not deserving of goodness. And if someone says, well, pastor, I think I'm disagreeing with you on that one. I think there's goodness in me. What you just found in you was not goodness. What you just found is pride. You, did, you are not being honest with the Lord and the Heavenly Father because we are undeserving. I sang that song, you know. Uh, ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving? That's what we are. We ought to thank him, love and praise him a little more today and a whole lot more tomorrow. Aren't you impressed with my wonderful singing voice? Get carried away with singing. But you know, we are undeserving. That's what we are. That's what grace is. Grace is God's goodness to undeserving people. What amazing grace. Too often, though, we get out of the realm of thinking that God's grace is given, and we get into the realm of thinking that I deserve something. Jesus said it this way. Are you with me? I have a passage in uh, Luke 14. I'm going to read through some of these verses. Jesus said, And he put forth a parable unto those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out chief rooms, saying unto them, Listen, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down at the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And when, thou art, and when he that bade thee come and say to thee, Give this man a place, thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say to thee, Friend, go up higher. Then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. And here's his verse in verse 11. You've probably seen it on your screen. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Say, hey, Pastor, what, what, what is he saying here? He is saying, think of yourself as an unworthy servant. Think of yourself as an unworthy servant. You know, couples, I'd really help your marriage here if you think about it this way. You are undeserving of that spouse God has given you. You are undeserving of the blessings God has provided you. 
You are undeserving of life today and breath today and strength today. You are undeserving of the car you drove and the house you live in. Amen? We are undeserving. When we get to the mindset that we deserve it, this seems to be a mindset I've been running into more and more. Pastor, I just deserve respect. You don't. Pastor, I just deserve to be treated differently. You don't. You deserve to be treated like a servant. See, this is the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We do not deserve to be treated well. Pastor, I deserve to be treated well. See, that's called prideful thinking. I deserve one thing and one thing alone. Does anybody know what it is? The Bible says, for the wages of sin is? I deserve death as a sinner. In fact, I deserve punishment for my sin. The only thing I've earned in this life is eternal damnation. Yes? When we start, be careful before you start saying, Lord, I deserve. Be careful. Aren't you thankful God doesn't give us what we deserve? That's called mercy. We are simply his servants. And that's why the Bible says, think lowly. Look at that phrase. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Look at that lastly, lastly. So we think lowly. We avoid strife. We refuse strife. We think lowly. And look at this last one. We esteem others. And the phrase is equal with ourselves. Is that what Jesus said? Let's look at verse 3. Let me, let me see if it goes this way. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others equal with themselves. Is that what it says? Some of us want to preach that one. Pastor, my spouse, we are equals. That's not what the Bible says. Pastor, we are equal. No, no, no. The servant says, you're better than I am. With me, you catch me on this one? This will revolutionize your marriage if you, can, if you regularly get to this mindset of my spouse is deserving of it more than me. My spouse is deserving a blessing, I am not. My parents are deserving a blessing, I am not. Young people, that will revolutionize your thinking. Parents, this will revolutionize your thinking. My children are deserving a blessing more than me. This will revolutionize you as a church member. My brothers and sisters in Christ deserve blessing more than me. See, we have to esteem others, not equal with ourselves, but better than ourselves. You are worth it. You are worth investing into. This is important. I thank the Lord for many people who had this mind of Christ who invested into my life. They took time. They took effort. They took a lot of dumb things I did. And you know what they did? They said, there's a young man I want to invest my life into because I esteem their time and their life better than mine. How many of you are thankful for somebody who took their life and invested and poured it into you? That was somebody who was thinking like a servant. They said, I'm going to serve them and pour my time and life and effort into them because I esteem them better than me. See, you know why we, we, we want to stay home sometimes on Saturday morning is because we esteem us better than the people that are out there who need the gospel. Amen? We esteem us better than somebody who needs the blessing of the Almighty God. But friend, we have to esteem others better than themselves. There's a song that I like. I'll sing here and I'll sing at the closing. It was written many years ago. It says, others. Others, Lord. Yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others so that I may live like thee. You have your Philippians 2 open? Watch carefully. You ready? It says in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. If you read this chapter in this passage, it is the mind of Christ is always thinking about others. Be careful. The devil wants you to immediately take your mind off and focus off of others and to place it on yourself. Friend, God's taking care of you. You need to be focused on others. That's the lesson here today. Question is this. Do you think of others? Okay. Do you live for others? Do you esteem, do you esteem or look upon others better or more deserving than yourself? Because this is the mind of Christ. This is the mind of a servant. You see Romans 12, 10 on the screen there here today. The Bible says, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor 
preferring my way? Is that what the Bible says? In honor, preferring us to 50-50 it, right? No. In honor, preferring one another. This is the mind of Christ. What a wonderful blessing it would be if every home, if in every home, everyone lived like a servant. Let's just take our minds here for a moment. Can you picture a home where the husband is there to serve the wife and the children? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Picture this, that the, the wife in the home was there only to serve her husband and her children. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And think about this. If every child were there to serve their parents and their brothers and sisters, and that's only the thought that was there, would you have any fighting going on? You would not. There would be no strife. There would be no vainglory because we would be thinking not about ourselves, but about others. Verse number four teaches us that we should be thinking and looking at other people's needs. We'll get to verse four with my next point, but thinking about other people's needs. This is usually the, this is usually the monster that has to be tackled when somebody comes in and says, Pastor, I need to have some marital counseling. And usually what they'll do on first day of marital counseling is tell me what? What they deserve. Pastor, I'm not getting what I deserve. Pastor, my needs aren't being met. This is every marital counseling session. I've never had a marital counseling. Pastor, we're having trouble in marriage. And the first time we sit down, Pastor, I'm just not esteeming my spouse better than myself. That's our marriage trouble. But that actually is their marriage trouble. See, and sometimes we've got to get the focus on, well, my needs aren't being met, Pastor. Yep, but that's not your primary problem. Your primary problem is you're not thinking like Christ. You're not thinking as a servant. Number two. Look at verse number four. Not only do we have to be a servant, a servant in heart, but we have to have a, be a servant in hospitality. Verse number four is really the definition, the biblical definition of hospitality. Hospitality. Verse number four says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This verse can be defined as hospitality. In scripture, we are repeatedly urged to be hospitable. The root word of hospitality is, see if anybody knows it. Hospital. Who knows what a hospital is? A hospital. Someone, some, someone once told me this, and I'm going to use this analogy to, to like it to a hospital. Someone said, Pastor, I, I, I would go to church, but I just got to clean up my life before I go there. I got to get some things straightened up before I go talk to God. That's like somebody saying, yep, I need to go to the emergency room, but I need to get healthy before I go to the hospital. Is that wrong thinking? That little messed up there? I, I'm going to go. I don't want to do a doctor's. I don't want to do a doctor's visit until I get real healthy. Then I'm going to go see the doctor, right? No, you go to the doctor because you're unhealthy. You go to the hospital because you need some help and a hospital if someone's coming there, they can't go, wait, whoa, whoa, he's way too sick. Send him home. Look at that blood. That's really nasty. You can't come back till that thing's healed a little bit. Do they do that at a hospital? Do they accept anybody into a hospital? That's what the word hospitable means. It's thinking of others more than you think of yourself. This is the definition of hospitality, and it's found in verse 4, that we look our, we're looking on the needs of others not on our own needs. This is the mind of Christ. Because when Christ came to earth, was he thinking of his own needs? The Bible's very clear on this one. He did not come for his own needs, he came for ours. As we see in a couple of places, first of all, hospitality needs to be a place in our home. The Bible teaches we should have hospi hospi hospitality in our home. Romans 12, 13 says, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. I really think one of the strengths of our churches in many regards are we are very friendly. We are very welcoming and we are very warm. But that needs to extend beyond just this. It needs to get into our homes. And let's talk about in our homes. We need to be hospitable to invite people into our homes over for Thanksgiving, over for Christmas. Have people come to your house. You say, but pastor, I don't have nice stuff. Did you know that's actually pride? That's what's keeping us from being hospitable. 
In fact, many of the excuses for not being hospitable stem from pride. Think about it. Our house isn't clean. We're too busy. We don't have the money. I'm too tired. We don't have nice enough furniture, Pastor. We don't have enough room. Many things I think people will overlook if you're looking to help and be an encouragement to others. I think that as Christians, we should open our homes and open our time and open our, uh, open our, what God has given us to help others and to serve others with our hospitality. Titus uh, chapter 1 verse 8 says, But I be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, and temperate. We need to have hospitality in the home and let her be hospitality in the church. Hospitality in the church. Now, in the church is what isn't just shaking hands with folks, but that's, that's where it starts. It starts in the church when a person comes in that we find somebody to shake hands with. I've always been against, and you've probably heard me say this a few times. I'm always against. If you come and say, Pastor, I'm upset because nobody shook my hand on Sunday. You will find that Pastor will be a little bit upset with you. You know why? Because you didn't shake anybody's hand on Sunday. Amen? Some people didn't get it, all right? Because if you didn't shake anybody, if nobody shook your hand on Sunday, that's simply because you didn't choose to go shake someone's hand, right? And that's what hospitality, that's where it starts. Finding somebody to get out of your comfort zone, out of your circle, out of your... See, the devil's working on our society in this regard, isolating people. Did you know that? The devil is really causing some havoc in our homes, in our young people's minds, because we are isolated. We don't want to get around other people. We don't want to learn about other people. We don't want to have to deal with their problems. And that's what God's calling you to do. Have you found that people are more miserable now when they don't have to deal with other people's problems? They can't even handle their own mind's thoughts. And God makes a promise as we are there to bear one another's burdens, God says, I come and bear yours. That's our job, people. We're to be servants one to another. We've got to have hospitality in the church. In fact, our church is to be the epitome of hospitality. We must, um, in fact, we need much help in making this place a more welcoming and warm for people not only coming here, but in connecting here. Often we do get this backwards. We expect people to hold the church in high regard. When in reality, it's the opposite. It is the church who must hold people in high regard. Sometimes we get that a little bit backwards. Oh, pastor, people have to treat this place like the sanctuary. No, we have to treat this place like a welcoming home. We have to treat this place like a hospitable place. Um, every, uh, I'm one of those people, I'm a home buddy anyway. I'm a natural home buddy. So I will definitely invite you to my house. But you know, if you come to my house, I'm not going to be that picky. We have carpet in our house that are cats. We have cats with claws. I sure don't like cats with claws. I like cats. I just don't like their claws. They kind of scratch stuff up. Um, but if you come to my house, I don't allow our family and our children, and I, I do not eat where the carpet is. We go to the kitchen, right, where we eat. I don't walk on the floors with shoes. I take those off. I want to walk around in socks. But look at this. If you come over to my house, guess what I will say? Eat anywhere you want. You know why I do that? Why do I do that? Because we're tr I'm trying to be hospitable. I don't say, wait, 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 hey, you got to go outside and take your shoes off before you come into my house. Now, there's some cultures that are like that, but you know what? Come right on in. You can take, walk all over the carpet. You know why? Now, some of you are going to feel bad. You're going to come to pastor's house. The pastor, you told me to walk on the carpet with my shoes. Yes, because the carpet is there, not for me, but for who? Are you guys with me here on the thinking idea here? The church is here, not for us or for us to say, Lord, we kept it perfectly clean. You know what? I'd rather have it to be a hospital where we say, people, come on in. Pastor, they're not dressed right. Pastor, they're, they're, they're not treating the church like I think they should treat the church. Pastor, they're, maybe they're making a mess. I came in, I, I came in and, and I had to clean a little bit this week, and I saw some cracker crumbs. I don't know who had cracker crumbs in here, but I had to vacuum, clean up some cracker crumbs. But you know what? You say, was that you, Jack? That was Jack. And I don't think it was left from Lord's Supper first week, all right? But you know what? 
I thank the Lord for those cracker crumbs. Because you know what that means? I have the opportunity to be a servant. I want to be welcoming to people and invite them into the hospitality of the church. Some of you would be a lot more hospitable to your, from your home than you would be to the church. And I understand that mindset, but that mindset's got to flip. And this church is a hospitable place. We need to think about it as a place where we say, hey, don't go outside and drink your coffee. Hey, come on in. This is a place that we want you to be. This is a hospital, hospital, uh, hospitality mentality church. And sometimes we get it backwards. We hold the carpet in more regard than we do a person. And that obviously is wrong thinking. And I know that people can sense that. Many times we can't. But we've got to be a servant. You say, Pastor, they'll, call, they'll cause a mess. What a great opportunity for us to serve the people around us. By the way, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The servant. We are simply here to serve. The more kids that we get, the more opportunities we have to clean, okay? But I'm thankful we have the opportunity to serve our young people and thankful that they're seeing the opportunity to serve as well. Hospitality must be in the home and in the church. Look at that verse 4. Let not every man look on his own things, but every man also on the things of... I hope this has been, and I pray this is not always my... I pray this is my thinking as a pastor, that I'm not thinking about it from my perspective. I'm thinking about it from the perspective of others, and I hope the Lord gives us that regard. Sometimes I'll get somebody, and they usually have a stink in the church. Usually the stink in the church is not because someone's looking on the things of others. It's because someone's upset because someone didn't look out for them. I'll be honest with you. Pastor, you forgot thinking about me in this regard. That's not the mind of a servant, is it, folks? Now, if you came and said, Pastor... And, you know, maybe it's an older person. You overlook the teenagers here. I will definitely be more inclined to listen. If a young person says, Pastor, you sure didn't think about the older people here. I will be very inclined to listen. But when someone says, Pastor, you're not thinking about me. I, that's not the right spirit. That is not the spirit of a servant. The spirit of a servant says, I'm not interested in looking upon my own needs. I'm interested in looking on the needs of others. Folks, I know that this sounds a little different, and I know maybe some of our prides are a little ruffled, but this is the mind of Christ. We must be a servant in hospitality, a servant in heart, and lastly, number three, a servant in humility. Verses seven and eight, of course, we read in verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, did Jesus Christ have the wherewithal to come and command people? Yes? He's the king of kings and lord of lords. But look at what it says in verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And of course we believe Jesus Christ is equal with God. He is God in the flesh. Look at verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation. Underline that phrase if you will. Because the Bible is telling us that not to reveal who Christ was but to reveal who you should be. This is the mind of Christ. So this is a servant in humility. The Bible says in verse number 7, he, took, he made himself of no reputation. Pause. Did he have a good reputation? Yes or no? The Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He had it all. He did it all. He made it all. He never said that one time he was here. Did you notice? He never came and said, look what I did. Hey, do you not realize who you're talking to? Hey, hey. You forgot about me. I'm the guy you're supposed to be looking at. I'm the guy you're supposed to be listening to. He never did that. He made himself of zero reputation. I feel that some of the danger that we have in the Christian life is we like to come and we like to talk about all the good things about us. That's not the mind of Christ. Folks, there is nothing good that you need to talk about you about. 
Let me tell you my resume, Pastor. I'm good in this way, and I like this, and this is what I've done for others, and I've been here a long time, and I've taught this much, and I've... I don't think that that's the biblical mind of Christ. In fact, I will say this, letter A. We need to refuse our reputation. Have ourselves no reputation. Now, some of you, if you say, man, I got a, I got a, a past... I got a past that, man, it is full of problems. Forget the past. Pastor, I've got a past that I've served the Lord since my youth. Forget the past. Whether you've served the Lord or whether you've disobeyed the Lord, I think that all of us today need to say what Paul said in this passage. In fact, it's the next chapter of Philippians, Philippians 3, 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. That means he said, I'm not counting or thinking myself as being a good Christian. Now, was Paul a good Christian? But you notice, he was not counting himself to be a good Christian. You know what that would have been? Pride. He said, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind And reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Many times our past is a major hindrance to us serving the Lord today. There's either one of these two. Pastor, I've just, I've, I've, I've disappointed the Lord too much. The Lord can't use me. And I'm telling you this, friend, you are wrong. Forgetting those things which are behind, let's start reaching forth to those things which are behind before amen and you know god gives us another chance if if you're breathing air and if you're sucking wind god's got a plan for you serving him and you don't have to say well i'll start it off in the new year no start today get rid of your reputation well pastor i just have a bad reputation drop it at the door and say lord i'm forgetting those things which are behind paul was a persecutor of christians i think that that would have haunted him at night seeing stephen stoned that he was consenting unto his death. He said, I've got to forget those things which are behind because I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before. Maybe you're a Christian and you've been a Christian a long time. Sometimes we have a lot of used to be Christians. I used to be a this and I used to be a that and I used to do this for church and I used to do this for the Lord. And I used to, hey, you have no reputation. This is where we come. Pastor, I believe I've earned the right. Nope. We have not earned the right because we refuse our reputation. When we come in the proper spirit of Christ's likeness, we have no reputation. This is a servant of humility. Notice Jesus Christ did not talk about himself. He didn't talk about what he wanted, what his feelings were. (laughs) Jesus wasn't a person who talked a lot about his feelings. But we know from scripture he was a man of sorrows. And well acquainted with grief. You know how we find that out? Isaiah told us it was. He didn't say, man, oh man, I'm just living miserable. You know, he was. I'm just living sorrowful. He was, but he didn't talk about his feelings. He was concerned about others. Jesus never pointed to what he earned or what he had done. And that's important for us to have the mind of Christ. Not only do we refuse a reputation, continue looking in verse 7. He made himself of no reputation, and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We see he is in the form of a servant and describes what that means. He humbled himself. Not only do we have to have no reputation, but we have to humble ourselves. I know this isn't a revolutionary sermon. You may have heard something like this before. Maybe this is a little new to you, but this is the proper way of thinking and living. Humble yourself every day. This is a prayer I pray. Lord, help me to humble myself. And if I don't, would you please humble me today? Do you know why I pray that? It's because I realize something about me. I'm a very proud person. Some, of you, some person in here might say, not me, Pastor. I'm not a proud person. Oops. It's always, 
it's the hardest thing to detect in our own hearts. It's pride. The moment you think you don't have it, you definitely do. And it's, in fact, the source of all sin. If you go to the root of all sin, if you say, Pastor, i got a sin problem, it's rooted in pride. This is something I, I wish everybody would really get to know and understand. If you have a sin addiction, it's not that addiction that's the root. The root is your own pride. You think you can beat it. Did you know none of us can beat sin and none of us can beat Satan and none of us can overcome temptation? Only Christ can. We've got to surrender to him. Some of us need to simply come and humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Do you catch the point there? Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and he shall exalt you in due time, scripture says. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul referred to this humility this way. I, in three words, I die daily. He would offer himself and his pride would he sacrifice daily. Romans 12, 1 talks about this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And I believe that humility is the most important thing for us to sacrifice on a daily basis, people. Young people, listen to me. We get too carried away with our own thoughts, ideas, and way, and we all do. You've got to get in a good habit of sacrificing that, or you'll never find the mind of Christ. It must come by humbly coming to the Lord in daily, and I think repeatedly, dying daily, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31. I wrote this, you must humble yourself, or else God will humble you. Lay down your pride, or God will have to rip it out of you. And sometimes the Lord has to do that over and over until we finally get the point and say, Lord, I've got to come humbly. I've got to come humbly to it before you. This is the mind of Christ, and this is the heart of a servant. And lastly, let's look at verse number seven. It says, and took upon, uh, verse number eight, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became, what's that word? Obedient unto death. He is Lord of all. Would we agree that Jesus Christ is Lord? Yet the Lord became obedient unto death. He became obedient to death. I find that to be a very, very hard thing to grasp. That he who makes all commandments and he who gives all commands, if he says it, it's so. He said, I'm going to alter and I'm going to become obedient. You catch that? And as a servant, this is the mentality. Now, I will tell you this. The second time Christ comes, he is not coming as a servant. He's coming as a king. He's not coming to be obedient the second time. He's coming to judge. He's coming to rule. And he's coming to rule with a rod of iron. He's not going to come and take answers, but he came the first time as an example for us because that is the greatest in his kingdom. Aren't you thankful that God just didn't say what we should do? He first showed us how to do it. He said, I want you to, I want you to do this. And I want you to realize a servant must become obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. If any man will come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We must learn to become obedient. I know this is from last week's lesson, but if we are truly thankful people, if we have the mind of Christ, if we're living like a servant, then we simply come and say, Lord, if you are Lord, you tell me what to do, and whatever it is, I'll do it. You'll never try find true victory in the Christian life until you can say those words to Christ, until you audibly speak and say, Lord, I'm your servant. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. We talked about this last week, and this is in our theme passage, John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We must be a servant in heart. Maybe, maybe before we leave today, we talk to the Lord in our own hearts and say, Lord, would you change my heart to be a servant's heart? Make me, Lord, a servant's heart. Here's my life. Take every part. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Maybe we need to serve the Lord in our hospitality 
maybe in some way we've been thinking a little backwards that we are to be served in some regard and not to be a servant. Folks, the moment we switch our thinking into some way, shape, or form in our home, in our families, in our churches, in our interactions, someone is here to serve us because we have seniority or superiority. That's the world's way of thinking. And aren't you, aren't you in agreement? Doesn't that creep into all of us? Doesn't it? It creeps into all of us. But this shall not be among you, the Lord said. And then lastly, maybe it's a servant in humility. Humble ourselves. Become no reputation. Find ways to humble yourself and become obedient. We need to have less, less and less ideas of how things should be run and more and more servants to be willing to do anything that needs to be done. This morning, I want you to ask God to remake your heart for the sake of your home, your relationships, your church, maybe even your life. Choose today to become a servant. Heavenly Father, we ask your word as we have spoken it this morning and we've all heard as you have had for us. The call to be a servant. It's not a glamorous position. I think that's where our flesh has issue. Our flesh is primarily thinking about us, primarily thinking about our things. We're primarily thinking about what we can get on, th- on Christmas or what we can give our own on Thanksgiving or Christmas and Too often, Lord, we leave you on the back burner. Too often, Lord, it is simply a heart issue that we are not thinking like a servant. We're not thinking like you, Lord Jesus. With every head bowed and eye closed this morning, I do not know where or how this could have helped you as an individual, but I have prayed that it would help every family, every young person, every parent and adult, every church member. Before we enter into the season Where we worship Christ, I hope that we start thinking like Christ. You say, Pastor Ben, something that was mentioned, one of those points, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Would you slip your hand up in testimony of that this morning? I see hands all over. Boy, a lot of servants' hearts are touched today. Do me a favor, and the Lord, I'm sure, would you please make a commitment and a decision and speak to him this morning before you go home? We'll give you that opportunity as we all stand to our feet right now. Brother Jack, would you come? And before we sing, the organ will play. If you have a decision that needs to be made, would you do that for your Heavenly Father's sake this morning?